Okay, as Adam pointed out, it's time to start. So, uh, good morning and thanks for turning up with more than a dozen people now in the audience. Um, first speaker is uh, George Harlow from the American Museum in New York and some uh, co workers. He'll talk about the uh, Guatemala Sucho Zone, where I had the pleasure to go earlier this year. And I'm excited to see this. Oh, that's backwards. forward, backward. Okay. Well, I'd like to see a stalwart audience for this talk. Uh, as some of you may know, I am the uh, the leader of the the Jada Tite or the Hadero group. Sort of, I'm the proselytizer for the significance of Jadeite, and I'm going to talk today about uh, <clears throat> uh, the significance of Jadeite as a transfer, an evidence of transfer from the uh, fluids from the subducted slab into the mantle wedge using uh, approximately 60 whole rock analyses. So what is the what is jadeite? It's essentially a rock composed principally of jadeite in the gem industry. That may be 95%. In the uh, petrology, it's probably something on the order of 70 to 80% or more because oftentimes they're altered, they're found. In situ, which are few places, in veins and blocks in serpentinite melange, but normally they sh turn up as uh, erosional features down in streams below the, the serpentinite melanges. They're closely associated with high pressure, low temperature metamorphic rocks like eclogites and what I would call glaucophane metabasites rather than lucius. And over the years, we've come to an interpretation of two styles of formation. One is the direct precipitation from a hydrous fluid in veins uh, penetrating into the mantle wedge. Those are called p-type. And then uh, metasomatic replacements of some other lithology, usually something like what would be called a plagiogranite or trongemite, or even in the case in the Alps of, of, of um, basaltic rocks. So essentially, we're dealing with this kind of situation, just a simple model of water, uh, dewatering of the subducting slab, the water rises. And if we actually look at jadeites, we, uh, oh, that's fine, yeah. That's, no, I appreciate it. Um, so what you find very commonly in the cores of jadeite crystals in these rocks are uh, two-phase fluid inclusions, usually twice seawater, but sometimes we find less salinity and sometimes even uh, methane inside. So this in interpretation of, of origin means that the fluids are penetrating into the mantle wedge and therefore they're part of the transport system. And if we look at the uh, composition of the jadeites, we should get some idea of what is being transferred from the subducting slab into the mantle wedge. So what the purpose of this talk is purely phenomenological in the sense of looking at the data to see, show you what uh, we are seeing and say, what is this record, first off? What are potential components that may have been dissolved and transferred via these fluids? Is there diversity along strike? Um, and is there a variation with uh, maybe depth in terms of the conditions under which they form and with time? I'm really not going to deal with the latter two today. So let me introduce you to uh, the Guatemala Suture Zone. It is the essentially, um, oops, where is that? Okay. So there are three conjugate faults that divide uh, the North American plate from the Caribbean plate. And the central one of those is the Motagua Fault System. And on either sides of that are two terrains which contain um, serpentinite matrix uh, melanges. In the case of uh, Guatemala, these melanges are serpentine. They're totally serpentinite. There's very little evidence of, of uh, sediments within these melanges. And the blocks are found in various places. So we have the North Motagua melange that dates to about 70, 75 million years. And the South Motagua melange is a separate, separate one with dates on the order of 130 million years. And my uh, <clears throat> colleague, Kenneth, Flores presented data in a poster earlier showing that the, date, the dates of the zircons inside the jadeites are more like 95 million years. 
and 154 million years, 150 something odd million. So the jadeites are actually older than the, than the exhumation or the peak metamorphism recorded in the eclogite. So they've actually been implanted and not subducted. It's more, further evidence that we're actually in the mantle wedge. So the dots show you the places where jadeite occurs or jadeite, and in this, the northern part, it's more than 200 kilometers, and in the south, it's a very much smaller area, but with three distinct lithologies. So here's a list. The names are going to be meaningless to you, but they're groupings where we find uh, regions of blocks. We wanted to look at them discreetly, geographically, to s try and do this sorting operation. We have both jadeites, and then there's another rock type that usually occurs Omphysitites, they're not eclogites, they're just similar rocks to jadeite, in other words, massive amounts of one mineral, and they tend to, we interpret them as occurring somewhat later in the progression, but we wanted to see what, what their compositions might tell us about their origin distinctly from jadeites. So we have the, the northern group, which is, a, which is the long 200 kilometers, and the southern group, which is essentially three distinct localities and then things pulled out of one river where we're trying to sort what, what went into the river. So it's more than 50 analyses of jadeites. Now here's the mineralogy. The, the main thing is that even though jadeite is the primary mineral, there are a lot of, of uh, smaller amounts of minerals, some of them primary, a few of them are, are secondary. And I just show up here to show you the, that the minerals hold the chemistry information, and you need to know, distinguish between the sodium-rich phases, the large ion lithophile phases like, like micas and feldspars, um, the CA-rich phases like, like omphacite, zoocyte, lawsonite, and uh, even titanite, and then the titanium-rich phases, which is largely titanite, but in some cases, rutile. So there is this, and then there's some barium-rich minerals, which are unusual, banalcite, celsian, uh, kumarite, which is the hydrated version. So this is essentially there are holders that contain dense amounts of certain elements. So first, let's, I'm showing this to give you a sense of this is the bulk composition of a group of jadeites in the central part of the north. This is, okay, this is N-morb, and that, this is sediment gloss and an Antillian uh, continental sediment uh, in yellow. And the reason why I wanted to show this one is because Morb is so depleted in potassium, whereas if you look at the jadeites, and they go both below and above Morb, but never above the sediments, and then replotted them normalized to Morb, because that's an easier way to look at things. I'm considering that the subducted slab is altered Morb, and then sediment sitting on top of it, so those are sort of your two end members of things that could be uh, being sampled by the fluids to create the jadeite. So the thing you see here in this grouping is certainly aluminum and sodium are highly enriched. Then calcium, magnesium, iron are depleted. We don't have a lot of omphacite or other uh, ferromagnesian minerals. Then a big peak in potassium, but it's a peak compared to MORB. And then essentially depletion in most of the others. If the, we then compare the two extremes of the northern melange, what we see is a diversity. So you see this sort of typical jadeite signature over here, and then a potassium, probably a mica-rich signature here. But here, otherwise, it's sort of a mess. Whereas we go to the eastern end of the system, and it, they seem to be very similar to one another. There's not as much diversity. So we're, we're seeing something different about the sampling that's going on here of the fluids and the sampling that's going on down here. Now, if we compare the, a similar extreme on the south side of the Motago Fault, here the potassium is even more enriched. They tend to have a lot of fengite in them. They're less depleted compared to Morb. They're, you know, they're in this range rather than down here. For the ones at the, these coexist with Lawsonite eclogites. And these, which are Pompeliite uh, jadeites, they are very much depleted in magnesium, iron, and uh, and essentially they're white rocks and have less uh, enrichment in, uh, in, the, in the potassium. So this has seen something very different from, from this one, even though they're from slices of melange no more than 10 kilometers apart from each other. 
So if I compare what can I get out of the bulk chemistry of everything, the thing that, that really falls out is that, um, that the titanium is more enriched in the southern group than in the northern group. We find, actually find rutile in the southern group. We don't really find it in the northern group. A lot of titanite, very little titanate. If we look at the relationship between calcium and magnesium plus iron, it really almost falls on a nice mixing line as if omphacite and jadeite are really what are controlling calcium and magnesium, except up here, these are the bumpelliite jadeites, and then there are some um, things from, from Carazal Grande which contain lawsonite that are up here. Oops. With respect to the rare earths, the, the northern group, which is more pure jadeite, is, uh, tends to be very much depleted. This oddball is uh, anybody's guess, whereas the ones from the south look like something between morb and sediment mix, very, very similar, just somewhat depleted. Now looking at, this is, uh, I've rearranged the elements according to field strength, and there are a couple of things that really fall out here. One is, uh, this is, is hafnium and zirconium. There's always a relative hafnium zirconium peak. There's a big uranium peak, a much smaller uh, thorium shoulder, so uranium is enriched, but thorium is somewhat, but not as much. Europium goes up and down. Um, typically, nickel is very low, and then the LILs go up. So you get a lot of LILs. And if we compare, essentially, we look at different parts of the system, we see different, you know, some of them are very depleted in the rare earths, as we showed before, whereas this uranium, uh, the, the hafnium zirconium, uranium, potassium, is in, and lead are always enriched. So just quickly for the omphacetites, the omphacetites, because they have calcium and magnesium, are, are brought back up in this, in this range here, but they still tend to be, uh, they're depleted with respect to potassium because they usually don't have mica inside of them. So they're seeing, that, you know, whatsoever's going on here is not sampling that sediment spike that's over here, whereas in the south side it's quite different. You see that you do see the potassium peak. And looking at the omphacetites, they too have this in slight enrichment, not as much. In, uh, in this case, with the, uh, the hafnium and zirconium, in this case they don't. A little bit of uh, uranium and lower thorium. And then the high end, the LILs, potassium really isn't enriched. And finally, um, this is a plot that, that Horst has used in his recent paper and is showing the relative sort of solubility, the movement of, of, of lead and lanthanum around to, so what the, what the interesting is, this is the same relationship that he showed in his paper with fluid mobility. But the interesting thing is the things, the, the north side has the high lead enrichment and, and, and uh, lanthanum enrichment, whereas the south side is just the reverse. So whereas he just showed a stringer, we actually show the dividing line between the two systems in our rocks. So the take-home message, as far as we're concerned, is you get, a, a, you get a, a lot of variation between different locations. So we're not seeing the same thing all the time. Except the zirconium and hafnium is somewhat enriched. That means that they are movable in the fluid of high pressure with a high sodium content. Uh, thorium isn't as mobile, which is an important thing to continue to see. The rare earth patterns um, vary primarily, I think, with the composition of the jadeite or they're bringing albite around. Um, indiv individual localities show significant variation. I think that nickel is an important indicator of whether we're seeing alteration of the serpentinite or the formation of serpentinite while the fluids are there. We're seeing olivine contributing nickel to the composition of the jadeite. We don't tend to see chromium until the very end, as in the omphacetites. Um, the northern Motagua melange is um, um, more enriched in incompa incompatibles in some parts of the area, but the, uh, the well, well, I will just sk skip that. And um, so the, and the last thing is the southern group tends to be more titanium enriched and also more calcium magnesium enriched. So it may be that they're seeing more, more contribution from the altered oceanic crust and less contribution from the sediments, while the north is seeing more contribution. But there's still a lot of variation going on in all of this. Thanks a lot.
Okay, I think we can take uh, one question. Maybe if anyone has a question. Answered all their, everything they wanted to know. Excellent. So, um, well, in that case, we move on to, thanks, George. Uh, move on to um, the next talk, the, uh, the pest of geochronology, excess argon. And this will be presented by Andrew Smy. And co-authors are listed on the slide. Thank you. So, go ahead. So you're using Mac. OK. And this is the pointer. Great. And it's back and forth. Brilliant. OK. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk to you this morning about how we might be able to use or glean meaningful information about fluid flow and metamorphic devolatization uh, using um, excess argon as a tracer in subduction-related rocks. So this work forms uh, the results of an ongoing collaboration between myself, Claire Warren, uh, and Mike Bickle. So the background is, is pretty similar to a lot of the talks in this session. Uh, during subduction, we have hydrated lithosphere being conveyed to mantle depths. Um, majority of the water is expelled before the slab reaches around 20 kilometers through the collapse of um, porosity. And how much water remains at depth is the, uh, the topic of active research, hence these sessions. Uh, it's important for um, fluid overpressure, the generation of intermediate depth, earthquakes, the genesis of arc magmas, chemical geodynamics, to so transfer between the, the upper lithosphere and the stenosphere and indeed the mechanical properties of, of subduction. So it's very important. Um, to this end, we may look at uh, ultra-high pressure rocks and high pressure rocks as effectively as chemical and physical probes into sub-arc regions. So they provide a, a great record of what's happening down at depth. So this is a, a compilation of um, argon-40-39 single grain ages from uh, published uh, data from a, a range of Phanerozoic UHP and HP domains. Each row corresponds to the same sample. Each point is a single grain. And there are three main points to note here. The ages are expressed as percentages, so the ages are normalized to the accepted date of high pressure metamorphism as determined by the uranium lead or lutetium hafnium, so high retentivity geochronometers. Um, three points are, firstly, that excess argon is ubiquitous. Uh, through, it's an extreme example in high-pressure rocks. Um, secondly, that we, get, we note that uh, there's considerable scatter in, or intergranular age scatter. So again, lots of different ages in the same sample. Um, so that's telling us something about the scales of fluid mica or argon isotopic exchange. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, is the fact that we consistently get older ages in the mafic equigites than the cogenetic pelites. So, so why is that? Certainly because the mafic equigites have lower potassium. Is it telling us something about the, grain boundary, the properties of the grain boundary network? So the, present, the presence of excess argon tells us that immediately that one of the implicit assumptions in interpreting an age as a cooling age is invalid. Now, that could either be because of a cooling rate, grain size, uncertainty over diffusivity parameters. But all those first three points there are, um, are small in their effect compared to the properties of the grain boundary reservoir. So traditionally, using Dodsonian um, interpretation of a cooling age, we assume that once argon passes the grain boundary, um, the grain boundary into the grain boundary reservoir, it's removed from the system via a combination of advective solute transport as well as diffusion. Now that's in the open system case. However, the presence of excess argon is likely telling us that there isn't an open system. In fact, this has been mentioned in several talks at AGU so far, and that argon has been, is, is accumulating and partitioning back into the grain. So you have a closed or a limited grain boundary, limited connectivity in the grain boundary. So in the absence of external, in, uh, or in the absence of 
further information to suggest that we have introduction of exotic argon, we may conduct a, uh, a thought experiment to calculate whether there's enough argon produced by the in-situ decay of 40 potassium from the bulk rock, uh, assuming that none of it is lost, so it's a fully closed system. So this schematic just shows that. We have a rock forming at, at low temperatures on, say, a, a continental margin before subduction, and that it, uh, it, it, 40 potassium decays to 40 argon, accumulates in the rock, and then it's heated up during subduction. And in Dodsonian behavior, we assume that all of this is removed uh, before the clock starts ticking again as the mica cools beneath the closure temperature. However, what we're going to do is just assume that it's fully closed, so we have limit, limited connectivity and all the argon remains. And we can calculate the critical parameters. It becomes a mass balance problem. And we can calculate the amount of uh, fluid fraction um, available or required to uh, explain the observed ages, and it's a simple mass balance. So our critical parameters are the partition coefficient, which is limited to uh, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 5 mica fluid, uh, that is. The volume fraction of fluid, or the porosity, the relative densities, and the bulk potassium content, or the modal microabundance. So in our model, argon is only allowed to exchange between the mica and the grain boundary fluid, no other phases, which is inaccurate, but it's a realistic assumption given how much we know about the partition coefficients of argon. So model solutions here are displayed as contours of um, partition coefficient and modal abundance, and modal abundance, and mi modal abundance of mica um, as a function of both porosity and excess age fraction. So the excess age fraction is one would be the age of the protolith, zero would be uh, the age of, of cooling. So you can see that these curves or the contours are asymptotic to the fully closed system case where all the uh, argon ret is retained in the mica and you get the age of the, um, uh, the protolith and the fully open system case where all of it's in the fluid. Now let's apply this to two natural data sets. We have from the Eastern Alps and Oman. So the ecligite zone in the Eastern Alps was conveyed to 20, 25 kilobars at around 34 million years. It pertains to the um, southern margin of the European continent. These are our critical parameters to put in it. And these two samples were collected within meters of each other, so small scale. Um, CWT is um, an echogite fastest P light. CWT 13, rather, is um, an, a mafic echogite. And you can see that this is using a partition coefficient of 10 to the minus 4. And you can see that uh, the observed age ranges in the mafic echogite are only reproduced when we have. Uh, porosity fractions of 10 to the minus 5 volume fraction, and in the p-light, 10 to the minus 3. So let's go on to a man. Again, we can do the same thing. And we see this order of magnitude discrepancy between the mafic and the p-light. So 10 to the minus 5 in the mafic light, 10 to the minus 3 in, or 10 to the minus 4 in the um, cogenetic p-light. So this model provides us with a limiting case against which we can analyze the processes which might remove argon from a rock undergoing subduction. And how uh, justified is our assumption that it's fully closed? Because if argon was lost during prograde subduction, um, these porosities would reduce. So let us consider three factors that are going to be key in the removal of argon from a subducting rock. Firstly, diffusion. What I've done here is calculated um, effective diffusion length uh, for three typical um, subduction PT trajectories. And you can see that the typical diffusion length is 10 to the minus 7 meters, so sub micros micrometer, sub grain scale, length scale. So it's, in it's ineffective. Argon diffusion solely by intracrystalline diffusion in a subducting and continually equilibrating mica would be ineffective by diffusion alone. Um, similarly, we have diffusion length scale here for, as a function of residence time and temperature. And we need temperatures in excess of 500 degrees C and residence times over 5 million years in order to effectively remove argon, inherited argon, from uh, mica grains on uh, millimeter scale. So typically, typical grain length scales that we see.
So if, if we're going to remove argon from a subducting rock, we need, it's critically going to depend on the presence or absence of a fluid phase, which not only increases the diffu speed of diffusion, but also um, advances um, dissolution reprecipitation. So just some simple uh, calculations using thermocalc to show how much fluid is uh, produced along these three PT paths for a MORB and a P light. For a MORB, you can see that the contours or the, the units here are relative to the amount um, of free water uh, in the system at green schist facies. And you can see that uh, in a MORB, the um, devolatization is controlled by a bunch of discontinuous reactions, uh, namely lawsonite, and indeed small amounts of water are released compared to the P light, which is semi continuous release of water due to the divariant reactions and the breakdown of chlorite, chloritoid, and epidote. The growth of lawsonite actually requires hydration. So we can imagine that the small porosity fractions correspond well with the devolatization histories here in the MORB and the P light. Any argon, uh, there's not going to be much water around in a, a subducting MORB to remove much argon. So finally, um, it's not only important that we, we have free fluid phase to advance dissolution and diffusion and to remove uh, argon from our system, but it's important that grain boundary phase is connected. So that's permeability and deformation is going to certainly control a large part of that, but also um, our di dihedral angle, if we assume textural equilibrium is maintained during subduction, is going to be important. So these plots are just schematics showing the competing effects of permeability, uh, diffusion, and devolatization in a subducting p light and mafic. And we can imagine that there's going to be an interval at which either argon is lost from a subducting uh, rock into a grain boundary network by either dissolution or diffusion. Uh, and that interval, um, the interval over which the grain boundary will be open uh, is going to be different for the p light uh, or, and the mafic rock. For p lights, the dihedral angle constraints um, for quartz rich systems are that the rocks are impermeable, or rather permeable, to high temperatures, temperatures in excess of the closure temperature, meaning that argon can be effectively be wicked away from the system. Whereas in mafic rocks, the olivine, olivine, olivine uh, fluid dihedral angles uh, close at temperatures beneath the closure temperature for argon. So it suggests that actually we can lock in inherited argon early on during prograde subduction. So there's potential, I think, to use argon, indeed excess argon, not to go with traditional interpretations as detrimental for geochronology, but use it as a tracer for the time integrated effects of metamorphic devolatization. Um, our, it, it, it provides a novel way to calculate metamorphic porosity, which is a rather enigmatic parameter. Um, and our, our um, calculations here show that porosities calculated for mafic acolytes have to be less than 10 to the minus 5 which is in agreement with geophysical constraints. And it suggests that oceanic crust is, um, must act as a closed system to effective solute transport and is potentially an efficient vehicle for the transport of volatiles to mantle depths, thus explaining uh, the seawater composition of noble gases in the mantle. Thanks for listening. We have time for a quick question. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. I'm sure deformation is very important in this. I mean, with micas, your planar fabrics are going to enhance advective solute transport, and uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure the model will be applicable to that. But yes, real rheology is going to be very important as well. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well, no, oh, it's on here. Well, horse sets up the next presentation. I'll yep, announce it as being from Wild Goose and co workers, Ruska Vervoort and Koska, delineating the PT history of blue schist rocks in the Ruby Terrain, Alaska. <laughs>
Well, thanks to everybody for coming this morning. I know it's early. Um, so this is work that I've been doing for my master's thesis at UC Davis. My advisor is Sarah Rusky. I've done work with Michael Koska at the USGS on my Argon work, and Dr. Jeff Favorit at uh, Washington State University has helped me with my Garnet work. So thanks again for coming. So I'm working on blue schist rocks from west central Alaska in the Ruby terrain. If we zoom in a little bit. Here we have a, a series of very complicated terrain systems in this part of Alaska. This is an old arc continent collision zone, so island arc um, subducting over a continental margin. This pink stuff here is the Koyukuk terrain. This is the island arc material. The, this is the Brooks Range is up here off the picture. We have this major Alaska Arctic terrain. And then rocks I've been working in are here, this orange and blue striped ruby terrain, RB. And the sample location that I'm working in is where the star is. I took two samples and been doing a lot of geochemical analyses on them. As you can see here, this is a very complicated area. What we're really trying to do is put some dates on the PT history of, of some of these terrains. The ruby terrain is quite small, but it does serve in a general way as a proxy for the Arctic Alaska terrain, and not a lot of geochronology has been done on this area. So this is the first absolute dating coming out of the ruby terrain. So if we zoom in here, we have a cross section. So the subduction initiated about late Jurassic time. Um, here again, you can see the island arc, Koyukuk terrain. Alaska Arctic is here, just plain orange, just so you can see the ruby terrain, which is sort of smashed here on the bottom. This is a paleo cross section, even though the map we're seeing is current. So you can see the ruby terrain was sort of accreted onto the front of the prism off the subducting slab. The, ro the rocks I've been working in are actually metabasite. Most of the rocks in this terrain are politic and quartzite, but my rocks are right from the tip of this, so from the, the kind of lowest depth that you can get in this area, uh, full of garnet, fengite, glaucophane, a lot of the stuff we've been hearing about this morning, uh, which allowed us sort of a unique opportunity to study um, multiple minerals in one, a couple, you know, proximal samples. So we were looking at specifically garnet and mica. Garnet, as you everybody probably knows, closes between about 500 and 600 degrees C, which in this system is capturing the peak metamorphic conditions. The mica closes about 300 to 450 degrees C, so we're getting kind of mid-PT conditions, and we, we are using that as a correlation to try to put together a more uh, complete PT history of this area. So our plan was to do first uh, a lot of detailed petrographic analysis. At UC Davis, we have a microprobe, so we've done a lot of microprobe analyses on various elements, a lot of petrographic analysis. We did argon work at the USGS in Denver, both in situ and uh, step heating on homogeneous mica. The in situ, we tried to target zoned mica, uh, which I will get into in a second. So in fact, both work, which we did in the fall, yielded a date of about 120 million years which was new data for us. And then we also did lutetium hafnium analysis on homogeneous garnet from one of the samples uh, with Dr. Jeff of Ward at Washington State. And this yielded two dates, about 160 and 132, which I will um, get into at the end. So the first step that we did was the x-ray maps. Um, we did a lot of work on the probe. Here you can see uh, it is a magnesium map. You're seeing an ampoule, a zoned ampoule. The core is in orange and then the rim is in yellow, and then these blue guys are garnet. Garnet between core and rim, at least as far as we can tell, is homogeneous, so there is no difference in the composition in the cores and rims of these amphiboles, so we're seeing, I think, one population of garnet, which is important. We've also been doing this magnesium map. We've been looking at garnet uh, in, magne in magnesium space, trying to see if lutetium or other heavy rare earth elements concentrate in the core. Uh, we have not found that yet, and we don't think we're going to. So they are homogeneous in that sense, too. We also have done a lot of work on the fengite, the micas that we did the argon work on here. You can see a zoned one. This is sort of a lighter, as uh, this backscatter electron image, a lighter core and then darker rims. We also did quantitative lines, so taking measurements of elements uh, along these lines to figure out exact concentrations. So we've completed that over the last year or so. The next step was to do the argon work. Uh, we did the step heating on uh, two aliquots of potentially hundreds to thousand micas. These are very small micas. They're about 70 microns. So we did two aliquots, um, with, and these were homogeneous, so we did the bulk heating on them, or bulk dating. So here's the first plateau diagram, so age is on the y-axis. Here you can see we did about eight steps. We get a pretty good age of 120 plus or minus 0.5 MA. 
Our second aliquot was even better, four steps, about 120 as well. So that was good news. And the next step we did was we did laser ablation on chips. So these were targeting uh, zone mica. This is a reflected light image of one of these chips. You can see it here in the corner, about three millimeters thick. And what we were really looking for were these zone mica. So you can see here a dark core and then lighter rim. We were hoping to correlate an age of the core to potentially the age of a garnet and figure out if we could put together an estimation rate for these rocks. So if we could correlate the 400 degree closure temperature to the same date as the 600 degree closure temperature of the garnet, we might have a good story. So we did laser ablation trenches, about 38 micron trenches going through here. We also did spots, single spots. Uh, but the problem with the micas is they're so thin that we were actually ablating into the material beneath it, so we didn't end up using those. So here's the data from the laser ablation. We've got 12 spots. As you can see, each bar represents a sample, ages on the y-axis. We got a, a lot of error on these, and there's a number of reasons why that is. But unfortunately, it, result, it meant that we could not discern a different age between the core and the rim of the mica. So we got a mean age of about 123, which is which agrees with the age we got from the step heating, but we were not able to say whether the core or the rim was younger or older. So that was the work we did at uh, USGS. The last step was lutetium hafnium we did at Washington State. In this situation, we had a, a garnet separate that we divided into eight equal aliquots. Each aliquot of garnet, or fraction as I have here, had about 1,000 garnets in it. So these are, again, very small. So we're averaging over thousands of garnets per each fraction. We did column chemistry and then measured each solution on the ICPMS they have there, the Neptune. And we get eight fractions up here. We did two whole rock analyses as well. As you can see here, the isochron, the Strawn, is not so great. We, the best line of fit gives us an, an error of 23 million years. So what we did was we actually divided this into two different uh, isochron's a younger one, which has six of the eight aliquots, which gives us 132 plus or minus eight million years, which is a much better error, and an older isochron of 160 plus or minus nine million years. So then the question is, how did we end up with two different garden ages that are 30 million years apart? So as we showed before, we cannot find two distinctly different populations of garnets in these rocks. Um, even within what we know are other zone minerals, the timing relationship here shows that our garnets are growing in, you know, generally in the same conditions. Well, one possibility is that we do have, zir we have zircon inclusions in some of these garnets. This is a euhedral garnet, it's a backscatter electron image. This little red dot here is a zircon inclusion, but it's very small. <laughs> and this could result in the younger ages. It cannot result in the older ages. So that could be one possibility. But the other possibility is that we had garnet growth from 160 to 132 MA. And that's what we're going to run with. So here we go, as we did lutetium hafnium, we get two different ages. So if we kind of wrap this all together, here we have a PT diagram. So you have pressure on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis. This is the history, essentially, of our, blue, or our ruby terrain blue schist rocks. So we have a, this clockwise pattern. So we have, here we get stuff being pushed down. At about 160, based on our, at least on our data, we have the opening of this blue area, which is what we're considering the garnet growth area. So from about 159 to 132, we have the right conditions to be growing garnet. If we look at the cross section again, we can see here the ruby terrain down here probably was accreted onto the front of this uh, prism and then sat for probably 30 million years. So this system was, at least for the ruby terrain, stagnant for, I think, a long period of time, which could, you know, is a viable option, I think, for these sort of subduction systems that could, could be open for a long time. So this tip of this wedge, which we were looking at in the metabasite, um, probably experienced similar conditions for a long time, so sort of sitting at the bottom there. So then if we keep going on our path, we get about 132, the garnet, the, the last of the garnets closes, and then we continue on our clockwise path. At about 120 is when the mica closes, so we're about 450 degrees C. So we're, we started exhumation somewhere in here. We're coming up, and then by about 112, based on not our work but previous work that's been done, um, that is when there's a cessation of plutonism and volcanism related to this our continent collision. So this is sort of when the system comes to a halt. So. With this data that we've processed in the last two years or so, we've been able to put not only uh, finite dates, but sort of come together with a story about what has been going on with these rocks, which is not necessarily significant before the ruby terrain, but 
significant for other terrains in this area, which have until now been sort of vaguely understood, but not um, there's no there's been no absolute dating of this area. So conclusions from my project have been that the correlation between lutetium and hafnium and argon argon has revealed more about the PTT history than just using one technique. We were able to put more than one timestamp on that PT diagram. The garnet population or populations that we have have been are more complex than we originally had considered, so that's turned into the main story. The zonation, the mica, which we were hoping to use to tell an exclamation rate story, uh, were not especially revealing, but have helped us put together some of the dating, and that the PTT history of this ruby terrain and the by proxy to the Arctic Alaska terrain have been much more complex than we previously thought. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, good timing. And we'll take questions now. Any question? Oh, there's one. Yeah, please speak up. So he was asking if there are other uh, the other trains show this this two core this two date correlation. I actually don't know. I don't think a lot of uh, absolute dating has been done in this area, but I think it calls for more as we've seen now that we've seen this double population that it would be great to see if we could actually see that 30 million year growth period as you saw on that terrain map there are probably tens to hundreds of terrains in this area. The Arctic Alaska is just one of the biggest ones that we've seen. Um, but as far as I know, most of the dating that's been done in this area has been in the Brooks Range proper, not south of the Brooks Range. And that's experienced a slightly different set of conditions. So I'm not sure. That's a good, good thing to know. Any other questions? So he's asking if there is any petrographic difference between the garnets. We cannot find a difference. <laughs> we've done a lot of microprobe analyses doing, so we've done yttrium scandium runs, we've done lutetium, ha I tried to do lutetium hafnium laser ablation to see if there was a, a measurable difference between, say, the core and the rim of these garnets. We've done um, all the major element analyses, and we cannot find anything that I would confidently say would distinguish a separate population. So that's why we're trying to come up with an alternate um, explanation for why we're getting two separate isochrons. Yeah. We haven't done any uh, we haven't done barometry since we've gotten these dates <clears throat> on either the fengite or the garnet yet, but we're gonna we're gonna do some thermocalc on it. Um, the, so some of the as you saw, some of the garnets are definitely heterogeneous. That's why we were targeting those those zoned micas, um, but some of them are homogeneous, and so we haven't, we haven't correlated the pressures yet. We haven't done much with pressure, unfortunately. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Our next uh, talk is an invited talk from uh, Tim Yohn from uh, University of Münster in Germany. And he will talk about uh, the fluid release from slabs. And I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, so I want to talk today about <clears throat> evidence that the release of slab fluids is indeed localized in space and time. So that we don't have a pervasive release of fluids. Actually, the fluids are produced in a more or less pervasive manner. But then as the amount of fluid increases, fluid tends to channelize, and then they release the slab in short-lived fluid pulses. This is a nice um, cartoon illustrating how the deep water cycle in the subduction zone is actually working. So we have a seawater altered oceanic lithosphere that is descending, it's heating up, and then it's continuously releasing the water stored in hydrous minerals into a forming porosity while 
kind of these dehydration reactions are taking place. So it's a local part in the rocks where the porosity is forming by densification reactions and liberation of fluids. So they fill then the gap before they actually leave then finally the rock. And as you see here in this illustration, it's so old, this animation, that you cannot download it anymore, I guess. But it's already there that it was accepted that melts, if they arise, they're channelized, and they do this in these channelized pipe structures. But for the fluids, it wasn't really a, um, on, the, on the concept so far. So, but now I will show you some images from um, flow pattern through the upper ocean, a crust from the Tian Shan that illustrates that the fluid that come from lower, that they, have, that they flow through the slab in, in kind of a channelized manner. So that, what you see here is a fine-grained blue schist, a thin section image, so a few centimeters. It's cross-cut by a vein, and it has a reaction hollow formed. And larger scale, we have a centimeter, decimeter scale, hands pismism, garnet-bearing blue schist. So it's nice, upper oceanic crust, and it's cross-cut by this vein, and it forms a reaction hollow. And we have this garnet-rich pillow sequence here, micro-rich pillow sequence here. In between, we have the vein, and we have, again, formation of reaction hollow due to fluid rock interaction. And then we have this spectacular part here where we have these massive blushes on both sides cut by this vein, and on both sides we have the reaction hollow formed. So there's a lot of fluid rock interaction that happened along these flow pathways, not at all, but in some of them. And so if you put those together, then we have also from this uh, general concept of the deep water cycle of subsection zones, we have the evidence that there's massive channelized fluid flow. So we have high fluxes that cut, that, that, uh, that cut the subducting slab. And if you consider that the crystalline, crystalline rocks do have a low permeability, then the question arises, so how much fluid is it in fact? And from where does it come? And how long does it take? And to address a little bit these questions, we investigated this uh, sequence a little bit more in detail. So we have a rock profile drilled, a sample profile drilled along this uh, perpendicular to this vein structure. And I show you a few data just from this side now. And this is the summary of the mineral assembly change that is actually taking place along this profile. These are the drill core sites, these little stripes down here. You don't have to go into detail, but what you see is from the con due to the conversion of the blue schist to an eclogite or accompanied with this conversion, we have an increase of calcium in the system. So this mineral assemblage is dominated by glaucophane, is more sodium rich compared to this one, which is dominated by omphacite, but also carbonate, titanite, and clinosoicide. So we have a, a huge amount, a huge increase of calcium on this side compared to here. But we also have already in this war rock blue schist, a decent amount of omphacite and garnet that had been formed before this fluid road action took place. So we have here partially eclogitized blue schist. So there was already a, a lot of fluid bearing minerals that broke down and liberated fluid into a dynamically forming porosity. So what we have here then is we have an external fluid that passed through this wet blue schist so that the blue schist the blue sheet that was already partially eclogitized, it had a fluid-filled background porosity, but very low calcium concentrations. This caused that the vein formed, this was roughly in close or in at peak metamorphic condition. So it was a eclogite, it's an eclogite facious mineral assemblage with a very high calcium concentration. And that interaction between the fluid and, and the wall rock caused that the reaction hollow formed, which is progressively higher in calcium concentration towards the vein. And because there's so much happening due to the calcium, so we looked to the calcium in a bit more detail. And what you see here is now the calcium isotopic composition of the system. So we have here calcium isotopes in the 4440 donation and um, notation. And what you see is that the blue schist war rock, that is pretty, this is also almost the distance because of the linear increase in concentration. So the war rock blue schist agrees pretty good with altered oceanic crust as being the primary kind of rock that actually experienced the, the, the subduction. But this, the vein forming fluid is so heavy in calcium compared that we cannot build, make this out of a seawater oceanic crust alone. So what we need is either we would need a source which is a very partial serpentinized mantle that would sit very deep compared 
in the strata of the slab compared to the upper oceanic crust, or a fluid starting from the altered oceanic crust that evolved due to uh, during a lot of fluid rock interaction, a lot of precipitation of carbonates. So in either case, what we have here is a fluid that had to flow over extremely long distances, something like, I mean, several kilometers, we, we think. Well, and then on the other part is here from this cartoon is to change the calcium concentration, uh, the calcium isotopic con composition and the, isoto uh, and the concentration, we need a lot of, lot of fluid, so high flux, because we actually double the amount in weight percent of the rock, but the, the amount of calcium in the fluid is more in the millimole. So it's pointing to a huge flux of fluids from far, far distance traveling fluid. So now to the duration. So how much time is stored in such a, a structure? So we use a lithium chronometry approach to get a hint on this duration. And the good thing for lithium is that it diffuses pretty fast. And it's a trace element in the fluid and the solid. It's a kind of a passive player in the game. And the transport ex is exclusively in the fluid. So the concept behind here is so we have our wall rock blue schist. And this is a calcium poor rock that is already partially eclogatized and has a fluid filled interconnected porosity, but a very low amount of fluid. It got in contact with a high calcium bearing fluid with a huge reservoir of, of calcium rich fluid, and that caused that the reaction front formed due to the uh, diffusive um, exchange for in, in the most simple uh, view between the both uh, fluid reservoirs, and this calcium increase drives mineral reactions, and as a passive tracer, the calcium, uh, the lithium will be exchanged between fluids and minerals. In detail, it looks like this. We have this, we have f f out of the fluid full porosity, there's a small portion that is interconnected to the vein forming fluid, and that causes that we have fluid solid exchange by dissolution precipitation reaction. So the blue rock become a green rock in a kind of corrosive interface matter. Well, so let's go to the chronometry. So these are the, uh, the concentration data here. These are, these are the isotope data. And we plug in a few data from the literature and assume for the first attempt to tackle the, the duration, a very simple approach, constant porosity, constant partition coefficient throughout the whole profile. And what you see here is we either fit pretty good the concentrations or we do fit very good or pretty good the isotopes, but what you see here with this little omega is that dimensional is time, and there's a factor of at least one order of magnitude difference. So it doesn't mean, it's not important what it means now, but the, the, it scales linear to real time, so that means that doesn't work at all. Yeah, there's a de uh, the difference in one order of magnitude time. So but we have to consider that this part here is an eclogite, this part is a blue schist, and there's a transition in between, so that we cannot assume that the partition coefficients are the same, because the partition coefficients are the sum of the fluid mineral partition coefficients and the modal abundance. So this is now acknowledged here in the next step. So we have here the calculated partition coefficients for the specific mineral assemblage of the sample suite, and we now allow the we start with, with a homogeneous um, partition coefficient and we allow the system now to change the partition coefficient as a simple linear reaction of the re uh, linear function of the reaction in progress. And we get already way better fit to the data, so the concentration look pretty good anyway. But here now we see we get either good fit for the, let's say, reaction halo or for the war of blue schist, and there's still a delay in four um, kind of in, in, in time, for f and the factor is four, so no, it's, oh, well, it's two. So we have to improve again, and that we do, and if you now consider that the porosity pro is also a function of reaction and progress. So what we have is we have a densification reaction, we have the eclogitization fo formation, so that means there's an, the, uh, from this point of view, there's a porosity forming, and for sure, when we have the dissolution of the blue schist mineral assemblage and the precipitation of the eclogite facious mineral assemblage, there's also a trans in porosity that forms. And if we acknowledge this, and let, let this be also a very simple linear function from the reaction and progress, then we get a perfect fit for the data and both now at the same time. So the perfect fit here for the concentration and the isotopes for the same dimensionless time 
If we now extract the real time by this little equation experiment here, then we get something like 200 years. Well, if we play a little bit and we just have a look to the little cartoon down here because the isotopes are more sensitive to this stuff, then we see if we allow the, react the reactive porosity to be 10 times higher the background porosity, then we get a really perfect fit of the data at the duration of 200 years for the whole fluid rock interaction stored in this reaction hollow. To sum that up, so I hope I con could convince you um, that lithium chronometry is a very powerful tool to determine the duration of very fast processes such as fluid rock interaction and we have to th consider that release of slab fluids is highly, highly channelized and the veins that we find in the field act as a conduit for large fluid volumes. We heard that the earlier this morning too. So, but also the fluid flow occurs over long, long distance and at high fluxes. So, but the interesting part is that the fluid rock interaction is surprisingly fast so that we may consider that overall the, con the process of, of slab Dehydration is a continuous process, but the release of the fluids from the slab itself it occurs in pulse-like manner and very channelized. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. We have time for a couple of questions. Bernard? Yeah. So the question is um, whether there are petrographic evidence that this, is, that this really happened at maximum pressure temperature conditions, so at depth, or it's not a structure that actually formed prior to subduction. And in fact, this was the first part before we started to deal with the lithium and everything else. It was the petrographic investigation of this structure, and we found striking evidence that this was a blue schist, and it was converted progressively to an eclogite at peak pit conditions. So we find from the inclusions in the garnet, for instance from the garnet you can really say that the garnet in the salvage is in the central part com completely identical to the one in the blue schist and it has only little overgrowth where we actually can see that the calcium increases. We see that also from the, from the, um, from the way how the glaucophane is replaced by uh, omphacite. So we do see the petrographic evidence. This is always the start. Yeah. Obedium strontium data is also proving. Okay, if there are no more questions. Yeah. Um, this was the final talk of our, the oral part of our session. We do have a poster session this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers for their excellent work and also for keeping on time. That's much appreciated. So I'll uh, give over to Steve Sparks for the daily lecture. <laughs>